Hey, everybody, today is Monday, May 8th, 2023. Coming up on the show today, from Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3, editor Fred Raskin. He did talk about the fact that this is a darker movie. One of the charms, I think, of James in general is his ability to kind of switch tones on a dime, that you can have these, like, super violent moments, then shift to comedy. And editor Greg Dorier. You're burying the lead, Fred. This movie has the first Marvel DC crossover. They fucking showed the clip online before the movie came out. What are you doing? Yes, all that and more on this edition of The Rough Cut. All right, welcome back, everyone, to another episode of the podcast. Of course, it's not just another episode. Every episode, even if the guests have been on the show before, like today's guests, is unique and special in its own way. So who are the snowflakes we have on hand today? Well, that would be the dynamic duo of Fred Raskin and Greg Dorier, here to share with us their experience on James Gunn's final installment of Marvel's Guardians of the Galaxy trilogy. Fred and Greg have been working together for, well, at least 20 years, more according to them, and it really shows in how they get along. In a good way, I mean. They seem to have a genuine appreciation for each other's talents and personalities in the cutting room. As is often the case with these big movie franchises, I am not going to spend a lot of time up front explaining the Guardians of the Galaxy. I'm pretty sure you know all you need to know already. There are mild spoilers ahead, if that, nothing to get too worked up about. Just lots of inside info from the cutting room and a lot of laughs. And what kind of tyrant would I be to make you wait much longer for something like that? That's a good question. A better question would be, who are you going to turn to for the very best music for your next film or TV show? Well, none other than those guardians of the production audio galaxy extreme music, of course. When it's time to fill up your Microsoft Zune with top shelf tracks from A-list musicians and composers, just head on over to extrememusic.com and explore their vast universe of music with nothing more than simple search terms like composer, genre, lyrics, tempo, stuff like that. Then they will hit you back with all kinds of tracks. They'll even let you choose what instruments you want and how long you want the track to be. And if that's not easy enough for you, well, you just upload a reference track to Extreme Music and they'll find you ones like it. Once that's all done, well, then comes the licensing part. I know, it sounds painful, but it's not. You can do it right there on their website. Or if you're feeling kind of lonely and you just want someone to talk to, it's okay, I get it. You can speak to one of their reps at an office near you and they will help you navigate the licensing. So the next time you have a story to tell, tell it with great music from our friends and sponsor, Extreme Music. All right, let's see if we can get these guys to come out of their shells. Or at least their editing rooms. From Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3, here are Fred Raskin and Greg Dorian. Honestly, there are definitely some interviews I'd like to start that way, but um, but decorum, you know. Matt, I don't accept that apology. <laughs> so now I'm in an angry mode right now. Go ahead, ask me any question. Blah, 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 big movie, blah, blah, VFX, blah, blah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe cut this part out. <laughs> Well, Fred, I have to say, uh, when I saw your movie the other night, I had a similar reaction to a lot of the Marvel movies, and that is just a reaction to the sheer amount of work that must go into it, just the volume. Between all the set pieces and the incredibly dense VFX workload, it feels like it would take certainly more than a village to get this done. So let's start off by talking about the time frame of production and post-production and who the players were in terms of the post-crew. I want to say production was about six months. Um, and during that period, the, the Guardians of the Galaxy holiday special was also shot, which our friend Mr. Doria here edited as well with an assist from, uh, from 2G's Featherman. And then post went 10 months, I think. That feels right. <laughs> we, we, we started, I want, I want to say we, we started in October of 2021 and finished in April um, how does that work out? Somebody do the math. <laughs> <laughs> so we had uh, Tanya Regal cutting alongside me during production. Amazing editor. Phenomenal editor, much of whose work remains in the movie. She, she really did a terrific job. Greg came on when he was uh, finished the director's cut on, uh, on the holiday special. And then we had a phenomenal team of assistants led by uh, Todd Bush and Jeff Steinkamp. They were our uh, respective firsts. And then... Aaron Lindhorst and Madeline Kushner, Dan Bockley and Mary Ma, and Alexandra Scratch, who I have to give credit where it's due, did the best female Russian accent so that whenever we <laughs> the temp Cosmo line, it was as though we, we had Maria. <laughs> and also a quick little shout out that Scott Jacobs came on toward the very end and actually was a huge help. Yes. 
Recently, I had the uh, good fortune to speak with another editor of many a fine Marvel film, that is uh, Dan Leventhal, and we were talking about his new film, Dungeons and Dragons. He said that for him, the magic of the Marvel universe is that the characters, despite all their incredible powers, are inherently flawed. And it feels like this film, the final and the actual trilogy itself, still has the Guardian signature style of comedy. The tone is is more personal and more sentimental than in previous films. And the things that are behind those flaws are really brought to the surface. So speaking of flawed characters, Greg, uh, what do you recall talking about with James in regards to what he wanted to achieve with this film in terms of the tonality and, and how he wanted the audience to feel? I, I never had a conversation with him about that, to be honest with you. Moving on. <laughs> <laughs> it is all kind of in there in the script. I think you kind of... You kind of get it from moment one with with the, the use of the song Creep. Um, you, you contrast that to the, the openings of the last two movies in the franchise where they have these upbeat songs that you're dancing along to. I mean, I think the uh, opening to the, the second movie, the ELO song with group dancing and the one giant long take as the, uh, the, the team is fighting this giant beast. Um, how are you going to top that? You're not. Maybe you're not. You're just going to go in a totally different direction because <laughs> that was, I mean, as main title sequences go, pretty spectacular. So, Fred, did James talk to you about the tone of the film before um, you started on it? He did talk about the fact that this is a darker movie. One of the charms, I think, of James in general is his ability to kind of switch tones on a dime, that you can have these like super violent moments, then shift to comedy. And in this movie, it was more dealing with like the darkness of the character's history, but that can also shift to comedy in a really effective way. Like you're not laughing any less at anything Drax says, regardless of how tense the situation might be. Can I jump in and inside a specific scene that I was always happy with all of our screenings that that tonal shift was always caught? It's the scene once they're on the Rete, it's the three of them, it's Nebula and it's Mantis and it's Drax. And Drax is, has, you know, crashed through the door and now they're there and Nebula is just pissed at him. And Mantis is defense is what nebula values as opposed to the essence of drax and so that the first half of the scene is this argument between nebula and mantis and then drax just has this this dry i'm not sure i appreciate this line of defense and every screening it gets a laugh that to me was a perfect example of what you're talking about fred that i always appreciated with the film. Yeah, I've never talked to James about it, but he's obviously lived with these characters for a very long time. And it seems like there's an element of it where they almost write themselves. It just feels right in terms of the way they're reacting to, to each scene. And I mean, it's obviously, it's all within his brain. They're all elements of him. But yeah, it was a blast to get to spend time with these characters again. And for me, my, like my favorite stuff to cut in these movies is when is when it's the group of them together bantering the scene in the first movie that was the 12 percent of a plan where they're all in in a circle like like that's that's my favorite scene in the first movie and kind of going beyond that whenever whenever these characters got in a room and started bickering and also showing their affection for each other at the same time that's my favorite stuff well you know that's going to lead to probably my favorite scene in the movie the bat family house <laughs> and i don't think there's another writer director that would have a scene like that in a film like this other than James. You guys talked about living with these characters for so long and, and really appreciating the moments when they're all together. Aside from the balance of tonality in this film, in a way you're closing out one arc and starting another one, which is kind of a tricky prospect. We're saying goodbye to these characters as we know them as a group, but then we're also, you're also introducing a new way to look at this group. Well, but I, I, I actually want to talk about one specific moment because I was working on the holiday special. And again, as Fred said, I jumped onto the film after finishing the director's cut on the holiday special. So I didn't have time to read the script because we were racing toward a deadline to screen the editor's assembly, which was two days after we screened the director's cut of the holiday special for the studio. So I, I just was kind of thrown right into the, the deep end. And basically, I watched 
the reels as they were at that point in time as I was jumping in. And so the end sequence that involved uh, Florence and the Machine, which uh, again is another highlight as far as I'm concerned, and and I'm gonna kiss Fred's butt because it's it it was amazingly cut even at that point in time. Uh, I saw it for the first time in early May of last year, and it was it was beautiful. But in particular, the moment where Drax is saying goodbye to Mantis, and part of the reason why it hit so much for me because obviously the holiday special was centered on Drax and Manus. So for me, it was concluding this arc of those characters that I'd been working on. And it, it just was so impactful. And I don't believe, I think the way that it was cut back then, I don't think that was ever changed. And I thought Dave's performance was really touching. And obviously, I, you know, I thought Palm's performance was really touching as well. So it was just kind of fascinating having worked on the holiday special and jumping right into that and seeing that moment. And it really hit me in a big way. Yeah. I, I, I think I finished my first pass on that sequence, uh, on the last day of production. Um, it, because James, uh, texted me, um, like, this is a phenomenal way to end the, like like to end production on this movie getting to watch the sequence because it, it like it's better than i imagined it being um he he was he was really happy with it now of course it 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 got a lot shorter and let me tell you a, a musical montage like that when you start making changes like that becomes incredibly arduous because you've got all these different different hit points in the song that are lining up with, uh, with, with the action in the sequence. And then to, uh, to have to, the, you take one shot out and everything is thrown off balance. And, and so figuring out how to, uh, how to both cut stuff out and then make changes to the music w without it feeling, uh, like you've made a change to the music. Um, that was, that was definitely one of the bigger challenges in, for me in this movie. Were there certain parts in the song that you really wanted to hit at certain moments um, in the montage that, that went away that you kind of lamented or, or were you able to always sort of rectify that? There's nothing that I lament. I, th I think the slow part of the song, what, what, current, what currently plays over um, Quill walking down the street in the daytime, I won't get into more detail than that. That section of the song I had also used with Gamora on, on the, the ship with the Ravagers. And uh, like there were two breaks in the song and it, it ended up actually making the sequence feel longer. And so it worked really well in that first pass where it was, the, the sequence was a little bloated and like was, was hitting everything. But I'm, I'm really happy with how it plays now. I think one of the funny things was that I had guessed as to what part of the song was gonna play over Gamora with the Ravagers, because that sequence was shot much earlier than, than the rest of it. Um, and so I had put that together early on and just kind of thrown a section of the song on there. And visual effects wanted to, to do that sequence a lot earlier than like long before the rest of the sequence was cut. And James was like, we can't do that because uh, like so much is going to change once the rest of the sequence is together. Um, and the hilarious thing is that I think with the exception of one shot, the finished version is the same as it had been in that initial pass where I guessed what part of the song was going to be used on it. So it's funny how these things work out. After the assembly, is there any rhyme or reason to what you might tackle first? Are there things you look at and go, okay, this is going to take me a little more time. I'm going to have to set aside more time to really get into this piece of the film. Yeah, uh, anything that I did, we really had to spend a lot of time on. <laughs> no, 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 no. Um, <laughs> I, I, you know, I think you know what, one of the things that is uh, that is challenging about working on a movie like this is that the visual effects deadlines are kicking in from the moment we start. I mean, literally, the first thing that was shot was all of the rocket flashbacks. Um, the, uh, the motion capture for the, like, those were, those were in a quote unquote pre-shoot. So two days before the shoot actually began, like 20 minutes of the movie was shot. Um, and that was the immediate priority because, um, Framestore, the visual effects company needed the time, needed the time to make all of the, like, to make those four animals look as photo real and, and as emotive as possible. Whereas 
in movies that are not necessarily visual effects based, you kind of have the freedom to, uh, uh, to, to do a pass on a sequence and, 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 and put, it, put it aside and come back to it later on a movie like this. You really have to nail it down. I, I, I think we had something in the realm of like 50% of the visual effects uh, had to be submitted by the end of production. It was something, something in that realm. Um, so you don't have the luxury of setting something aside. You really have to get everything in good shape and figure out if you can, what shots you're going to actually end up dropping. I mean, you can never get it exact, not, not that early on. But you want to get it in a good place so that the visual effects companies are working with something that is relatively solid. And so during production, it was visual effects who I really allowed to guide us in terms of what we needed to have done when. They had a breakdown of all of the sequences and they were, they were telling us, okay, we need this by this date. And so I would make sure that I'd gotten a pass to James as, as early as possible and that he'd given notes and, you know, we'd, we'd have to go back and forth. I mean, this is why all of these movies are two editor movies, because you have to deal with incoming dailies along with making changes to sequences that really need to be finessed almost to perfection pretty early on. Just looking back, Fred, it's been almost 10 years since the first film came out. A lot has changed in production and post-production over that time. You got things like uh, the, the stagecraft virtual sets that are now in use a lot of times. You have remote editing workflows. What have been the big tentpole changes in your process or the tools available to your team going back to 2014 with volume one? The most significant tentpole change actually is, was, is not so much related to the technology improving as it was the pandemic. We finished shooting The Suicide Squad in, uh, at the end of February of 2020. Um, we were back in, in L.A. for a week and a half when, uh, when the whole world shut down. And that began the, the work from home process, which James really took to in a big way. Like he really liked the fact that we could send him cuts um, they would have time code on them. He could watch them multiple times. He could make his notes based on that time code and send us his notes. And that kind of became our process really from the Suicide Squad going forward. We did not really go back to being in person until the mix for this movie. We were intending to. Production was in Atlanta, and I've got young children now and didn't really want to go and had learned through the course of doing both The Suicide Squad and Peacemaker that the way James now likes to work, getting cuts sent to him so he can give notes, didn't really require me to be on location. But I did like the idea of going into an office and seeing the crew and like having that relationship. Uh, and I think we, we did it for about six weeks before we ended up having two positive COVID cases in the, uh, in the cutting room. And, uh, and I was like, if James isn't here, this is sort of silly. So we went back to working from home. At least some of us did. And so that really was the process. The lone detriment to that was that posting stuff on pics, your only real option is stereo sound. Whereas I think on the, on the second movie, we, we were working in 7.1. Uh, on the Suicide Squad, when we were in production, we were in 5.1. Everything had to, had to get taken down to basically just a two-track. And so that presented challenges when it came time to screen the movie because putting a stereo track in a big theater is generally not optimal. And so knowing that this is how we were going to be doing the movie, I, I had conversations with our post person at Marvel in advance of starting that we should do um, the, the, we would that we would do things the way we did it on the Suicide Squad, which is to say when we had to do screenings, we did we did a temp dub. We'd go onto a mix stage and actually mix the tracks uh, as we did in the olden days. On the first two Guardians movies, it was our avid tracks that we were playing in our test screenings. But once we were uh, once we were only working with two tracks, that seemed like that was not going to be good enough uh, for for the uh, you know for, for for Guardians three. So the plan was to do temp dubs, and then unfortunately. Kevin Feige put the kibosh on that because he's like, I want to have the ability to make changes up until the last possible minute. And when you have to lock down your cut to do the temp dub, making changes that late in the game becomes an impossibility. If you've mixed a reel, you generally are not going to be able to go back. And so we had to come up with an alternate plan. And so that began our process where, you know what, I'm, I've, I've yacked for too long. I'm going to let Greg explain what we did. What am I explaining? <laughs> <laughs> well, 
well, hang on a second, Greg, because I, I think I can help you out, which is very rare. <laughs> I had heard that you guys had sort of a different model for doing this. And it reminded, going back again to that talk I had with Dan Leventhal, um, he mentioned a similar process. And I thought I would play a cut for you guys from Dan, since I don't want to misquote him. And you could react to what he has to say, talk about how close it is to what you're doing, or if it's exactly the same or not even at all the same. Sure. System I've been developing, which embeds sound right with editorial. And now the advance is that I have a guy who's actually the supervisor and also lead sound editor is working next door on Pro Tools and Media Composer with Media Composer being the center of the hub. So, uh, you know, it's it's funny because that allows us to be in a constant state of mixed, meaning that before what would happen is that we would get ready for a preview or a screening we would stop editing give it to sound outside you know and then they would do their thing and as soon as that screening was over and we started making changes that mix was done i think in essence that's so we had uh, fred what would the title be for uh for chris ian and ron like I never knew what their credit was. <laughs> I don't think we officially had one. I mean, essentially, mixer slash in-house sound editing. And I have to, uh, the guy who, who we started with, a guy named Chris Diebold, actually was Dan Leventhal's guy. Um, I, th I think that's who he's talking about in that clip. And the only difference is on our show, as all three of those very talented guys would say, they lamented that they were stuck working in media composer. Thanks, Greg. Um, <laughs> I should ask you more questions. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we did not have the luxury, and I don't know the reason for that. Maybe Fred does. We did not have the luxury of going over to Pro Tools. And so, um, you know, the guys would lament there were certain limitations involved with that. But they, all three of them, by the way, incredibly talented. And uh, it, it sounds like, and, if, and Fred, you can correct me if I'm wrong, that sounds like that was the paradigm. Like we, once Chris came on board, the challenge was Fred and I were working from our home systems in stereo and they were working, they had their room and they were in 5.1. So the work that they were doing was in 5.1. And the challenge always was like when we would go to send stuff to James on picks, as Fred said, it would be in stereo. They sound different. They just do. And where that really became a challenge is when we actually had to do our first screening. And so Fred and I have been working at home in stereo. And so we had to go in and spend time with Chris to hear how it actually sounded like in 5.1. And then, of course, the other challenge is you're in this small room in 5.1 and then you go into a large theater. So even though you thought something, there was always a certain amount of guesswork involved with that process, because again, you're in this small room in 5-1 and certain things would sound a, a certain way and you'd go to the theater and you're like, oh, we've got to go back, we've got to adjust. And even when you're doing that adjustment, you're back doing that adjustment in the small room and trying to interpret so that it, it would translate when you went back over to the, the large theater. Yeah, one of our test screenings, we actually rented the theater for two days and set up uh, the Avid in there and did our mixing actually in the room. Huge difference. Yeah, I mean, that was, <laughs> that, that was the way to go. Um, it, it was kind of like, that was the last step. You know, we'd been working on the tracks for a while and, and then, uh, and got them to a good place and then got to go through all the reels in the room. And the guys were great, Chris Ian and, and Ron, because for various reasons, like I think Chris uh, got this wonderful opportunity um, to move on and he had to. Ian had a situation where his wife was about to deliver. So we only had him for a certain period of time. And then we brought Ron on and all three were tremendous, had a great attitude uh, and dealt with our nonsense with, with just skill and grace. Um, for me, the, the one thing that I thought a little bit strange in this paradigm is you're working with those people and, and crafting the sort of roadmap of what you think the sound should be. And then the, the proper 
uh, or I shouldn't say proper, but the final sound team comes in, never having had that that conversation with us, never having gone through a, a temp dub or temp dubs to get a sense of how to to do it as we go into the final mix. And I and and again, our our uh, Chris and and Gary, uh, you know, from Skywalker, are phenomenally talented and did a wonderful job. And I'm very proud of the, the final mix. But I always felt like that that was a, it would have been a benefit in some way if those guys had been part of the process earlier on and had those conversations with us earlier on. So they would have had a shorthand with both the film and our thoughts uh, about how it played in terms yeah. of sound. I mean, I, I'm going to say a couple of things. First of all, I just, I just want to, uh, to, 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 to give, uh, give the proper credit. So, so we're talking about Chris Diebold, Ian Chase, and, uh, and Ron Eng. Um, th- th- those were the, the three guys who, who did this for us. It's not surprising that they were lamenting having to use Composer because they were using Composer for the first time. Chris had some experience with it. I, th- I think both Ian and Ron were, were basically like getting into it for the first time. And so just using a new, uh, something that, with which you're not familiar with is going to be a little challenging. Um, I actually think it was a plus as far as we were concerned because it meant that everything that they were doing was going right into our tracks. Oh, for sure. And it wasn't like it wasn't a case where you're doing it on Pro Tools and then we make changes and then the Pro Tools sessions need to be conformed to our changes. Whatever we did, like the changes were were there instantly. There might be some smoothing out that needs to be done, but I think it was it was a really straightforward process. And honestly, like I would love for this to be the standard going forward. And I think Greg's complaint is is legitimate in terms of you're going on the mix stage and and, and the mixers have not been living with uh, with these tracks and they haven't been involved with it, with its creation. Though to some degree, that's kind of how it always is. They always have our avid tracks to reference when they're trying to figure out how to make something sound. Let's let's go back and see see what the editors did while they were cutting the movie, um, and and that should be the uh, the kind of the, the guide. So they always had that as an option. In a perfect world, it would be great for sound editorial to to provide the person who is operating the Avid and being our like in-house mixer slash occasional sound editor. Because if, if it were part of the sound editorial team, then everyone would be on the same page from the beginning. There were times when our... Uh, in-house person had to do stuff that like we didn't have time to go to Skywalker and say we need the sound effect because we were it, 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 our screening was was the next day um, <laughs> but there were also times I mean it, it, it did work nicely where um, Dave Acord uh, one of our, our sound supervisors would send tracks uh, and then Ron would mix them in like with us in the room and uh and, and so we would be able to actually use the proper material and get it sounding the, the, the way we wanted it to sound so that when we actually got to the mix stage, we knew what these tracks were capable of sounding like. So if something sounded wrong, we had the ability to say, let's, let's, let's refer back to the tracks and see, see what, uh, what Ron had done there. So I, it became a really valuable tool. And it was just great to like with, with when you constantly have, uh, have new visual effects coming in where something might be changing that's going to necessitate a different sound effect being able to update it almost in real time and you know i, I also i want to give credit where it's due to uh, to to our picture assistants who were doing a lot of the like the, the first pass on some of these sound effects as soon as a new shot came in where something changed they were on it and they were they were adding new effects that uh, that, that to help get us in the ballparks so that we could understand how how this is all going to play um, i mean it was just, it's just a great team all around Every, everybody really worked together really well for me, that was the most significant change when it came to the process that was kind of born of us being forced to work in stereo in terms of the way we were sending stuff to James. And if I could uh, channel the high evolutionary, the one thing that I would do uh, in a counter-Earth version of, of this paradigm is that uh, the Avid and the Pro Tools would seamlessly integrate so that you could get the best of both worlds. Yeah. And by the way, everything that Fred said about the advantages of it, he's correct. Uh, and again, I don't know if I would use the word complaint. It, to me, it's just it would be beneficial if, you know, the, the final uh, sound team was sort of 
in that conversation earlier. That that's the only thing, the only point I was making. I would genuinely say if you are an aspiring sound editor, learn the Avid. Yeah. <laughs> because like, sound editor slash mixer. Um, like it's it's it is a really valuable tool to have. Greg, you see why Fred gets more questions? <laughs> No, I don't actually. Why? <laughs> Here's one for you, my friend. While we're on the thread of audio, your approach to building up the soundscape, doing the sound design and picture editing, there is, of course, so much going on here. Certainly in a surround sound Atmos environment, you know, you've got these effects popping off everywhere and the music coming in and out, you know, full and then a diegetic or the other way around. What is your approach to how you begin to layer up the sound design? Where do you start? What are the things you begin with foundationally? And what are the things you kind of leave towards the very end? Well, it, again, it's the nature of the scene itself and, and what are the challenges and what are the stories that the sound is is in part going to help tell. And you have your more complex sections and you have your more subtle sections. For instance, you know, in Counter Earth, when everything starts to go to hell in a handbasket, uh, one of the challenges early on is you've got all of these explosions, you've got all of this low end stuff going on, and then it, it builds to this spot where Warlock is flying towards his mom, and you've got all of these explosions going on, and you've got music that's going on as well that's building to a crescendo. And then there's even more stuff going on on the planet after that. So in part, you're trying to figure out what are the, uh, for instance, let's, let's talk specifically th that scene where Warlock is flying toward uh, his mother. And there's a lot of explosions going on. And at one point we see in the foreground, we see a, a car landing and hitting the ground. And so that's got its own sound. But the challenge is, if you just play every single one of those things, you're 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 both you're you're going to get fatigued, and you're going to lose the impact for the final explosion that takes out Warlock's mom and Warlock. So the question is, um, how best to de-emphasize certain explosions, and which explosions are the hero explosions, and how you sort of build to maximum impact. So that's one of the things that you, and you're thinking about that, obviously you put the picture together and then you start to assess what you do. And then the other challenge in that specific sequence is, where does music play in this? And at first, um, because to me it felt like it's it's it was a different little chapter with everything that was going on, because we just came off of Gamora and Blurp uh, uh, in the ship and there's an explosion underneath the ship and they get sent forward and now we're then cutting to Warlock and I just felt like musically at the very top of that I wanted to create a little bit of space to introduce the music that was kind of telling Warlock's story as he's trying to go and save his mom but at the same time there are these big explosions so you're just trying to figure out how to weave these sounds, what the sounds are, and, and, and what the balance is. Um, so that's kind of my approach, uh, certainly for, for more sophisticated um, sections that I'm dealing with. And that, that certainly was the case as well when Gamora almost runs over Quill and, 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 and Groot. Same thing. Um, what's the balance between music and sound and what sort of sound are you playing and can you craft all of that? Some of it's low end, some of it's high end. How do you balance the sounds of, of what Gamora is trying to do with the ship to try and have it stop? And at the same time, that ship is, is ripping through uh, terrain and, and how do you balance that? So you can kind of hear and tell those stories sonically at the same, same time that you're seeing it. Do you have certain tools or plugins that you use to do that sound design that you go to frequently, whether it's stuff for dialogue or stuff for sound effects? I don't have anything that's sort of a go-to because, again, I, I you don't know until you put something together and then you sort of see. And one of the things, and then circling back to what Fred was saying about having uh, Chris, Ian, and Ron, is I know that those guys 
would something I had never thought about uh, is sometimes they would apply certain um, uh, effects to sort of mitigate or, or, or smooth out some of the, f- the frequencies of the sound. Uh, and I wasn't aware of that uh, prior to working with those guys. And they also did that um, with some of the music as well. So I talked about, you know, for Fred, this is a journey going back to 2014 with this specific franchise. 2013. 2013. Well, okay. Um, that's, so that's when we started shooting. Started shooting in 2013. And you guys have been working together for about 20 years or so? Longer. Longer? <laughs> it, it, it's longer than that. It feels uh, longer. It doesn't feel longer. No, we just flew by. No, I, I and it, again, I, I'm going to lapse into the land of kissing Fred's butt. I, I loved working for him and I love working with him. And I'm not, I, I'm not even going to fucking hesitate on that. It, it, it's always been a joy. I mean, Fred is phenomenally talented, and I've said this to his face. As gifted as he is as an editor, and he's really fucking gifted, he's a better human being. Hopefully, Fred, you felt the same way. Oh, no, it was a nightmare. <laughs> Fred's also an astute judge of character. I can see that. <laughs> we work our asses off. We love movies. We love the process. But we also have fun. And uh, I'm proud of everything that we've done. And I'm obviously I'm extremely proud of, of this film. So uh, it, it has not been long. It's, it's, it's been an amazing journey. And I've, I've loved every time I've worked, I've had the chance to work with them. Well, there you yeah, go. No, it's, so. it's, 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 it's been a really great collaboration. And uh, I mean, I mean re- really uh, uh, Greg is, is a terrifically talented editor and we get along really well. And, and, uh, uh, and, and also, and also, seems to have no ego, <laughs> which, which is fairly remarkable. Um, like, like genuinely, like there, there will be times where, where he's, where he'll have a cut and he's like, can you take a look at this and tell me if you think James is going to like it? I do want to share one thing in terms of, do I have ego? Sure. But you know what that ego is? I just want to be uh, associated with the best possible film as a specific example sort of late in the game when we were working with Ron before we moved over uh, to, you know, to the final mix team, there was a sequence uh, at the Orgoscope and Fred goes, uh, I'd like to add in the sound of, of uh, a bowling ball hitting bowling pins. I had never thought of it. And I fucking laughed out loud. This, this is when Dr- Drax tosses one of the uh, the Orgo sentries into two other ones. And again, I, I never, I, it could be another hundred years, I never would have thought of that. And the second he said it, I started laughing. And Ron found the sound and mixed it in. And I just cackled. And I was like, that's fucking brilliant. So in terms of ego, I would be stupid to say here's something that i that to me just enhanced that moment in a subtle very cool way wasn't my idea never would be my idea because i never would have had that instinct i don't care it, it made that moment to me just so much better so well fred where did that come from uh i stole it from uh harry cohen's work on kill bill <laughs> <laughs> i can admit it <laughs> It's a sound effect that I've always loved in that movie. And I was looking at the scene. I'm like, this is the perfect place to, <laughs> to pay homage to that. Bowling strike on, uh, on, on one guy hitting two other guys. Why not? <laughs> and, well, and you know what's so funny? And, and Fred, you should expand on it. We're on the mix stage. And Simon, our, our producer, swore that there were other places where that sound was put in. And we kept saying, no, it's just there. And he's like, no, I, I know it's somewhere else. Um, there is one sound that does sound like it, but not anything that I put in there. <laughs> right. But it is not that sound for the record. You have the Wilhelm scream. Now you have the Raskin strike. <laughs> you know, on uh, on the first Guardians, we did have a Wilhelm and uh, and and I think it was I think it was Kevin who was like, uh, we don't we don't do we, we don't we don't need to keep doing this. Um, and so uh, James had had a friend uh, who played one of the Ravagers <laughs> in the movie, Dave Yarabeski, um, and he uh, whose nickname is Yarvo. Um, and he came in. To, he, he, he gets tossed out of a ship at one point. And so he did a scream that we that we nicknamed the Yarvo, um, the, the Yarvo scream. And it has appeared in everything uh, that, that James and I have collaborated on since uh that movie and 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 it, it has its 
own place in uh, in, in Guardians Three as well. Um, I, we're actually um, Steve Slanek, our, our uh, one of our dialogue editors. He found the perfect place in the Orgoscope sequence where where two uh, uh, two, two Orgo sentries collide in midair, and, and one of them is screaming with with, with Yarvo's voice. Um, so um, that is that is our version of the Wilhelm, the Yarvo. Correct me if I'm wrong, Fred. That came in fairly late in the game. I, we were in, in the midst of the final mix when when Steve finally came up with that. Right, it was very late in the game because I I, I kept I kept looking for places to, to use it and 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 uh, and I hadn't even thought about it there because we'd always had that sequence dry uh, or not dry, but there was no dialogue in it generally. And yeah, he came up with it. And was like, this is perfect. <laughs> so J- James was like, where, where are we going to put the scream? And I was like, I have no idea. And I had a couple of bad places for it and and then steve came up with it and uh, all all credit to him (laughs) as long as we're sort of talking about dialogue you know there are characters in this film that um that are all adr that the voices come later when i'm watching these films and in those situations i love to try and imagine who the editors were doing the temp voices and trying to picture fred's voice doing i am groot but just for fun do either of you do any of the voices who does who this is a sore spot for me because I, I I laid down a really perfect line, and in the end of the day, it you know they went with an, a voice actor, and I'm still fucking pissed about that. So I I, I don't really want to talk about it. Like, it, 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 but this gives me the the form. It was like um, it, it was um, when the guards are are rushing down during uh, you know the shootout with Rocket in the flashback in the flashback, and I had to. Uh, down here, down here, hurry! And it, it better performance than what I did right now. I don't think that's possible. <laughs> it was phenomenal, and I don't understand why it got replaced. So after, the, so I'm done. I'm out of, of this conversation now, Fred. If if any of your listeners want to pull that and use it in another project, they're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> I will make that available to them. Let Dan uh, know if he wants it. But we're doing temp vocals all the, all the time, and not only us. We, we have to give credit to our spouses <laughs> because um, um, the, the the number of times I had to call my wife in because yeah, n- neither of us are going to do particularly good female voices. So. What? What do you mean? <laughs> Hi, Matt. How are you today, <laughs> Mrs. Raskin? <laughs> uh, but yeah, so 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 there 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 are, in early cuts of the movie, there are plenty of times where where my voice would pop up as as Quill or Rocket or or what have you. Um. <laughs> uh, you but you've got to point out uh, actually the really great job that you did. Remember when you did Dave? Oh. <laughs> There's, there's. I, I did Batista at one point, and and uh, and James uh, was was certain that 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 it was him, um, which is which is hilarious because that guy has such a unique voice. It's like, <laughs> I, I I think it might have been more that I started out actually using real Dave, and then it became me. Well, but can because it, it was a it, it was a sequence that I cut, uh, and I want to take a, a little bit of a bow here because I pitch shift you a little bit to get you in that lower register. And when I did that, I was like, oh, that that actually is pretty damn good. So can I share one really cool spouse ADR story with We're you? We're all about sharing here. Love that. So this is actually my wife was was an actor back in the day and she's really talented. She's got a, a really great voice. So I, as Fred is saying, where Fred turns to his his talented wife, I always turn to my wife. And when I was working on the holiday special, there was two lines from an off-screen 911 operator. And so I had Helene, my wife, record those lines. And they were in there for the longest period of time. And, and once I'd moved over to the feature, they were still in the holiday special. And there was one point we were in, in the VFX uh, screening room looking at a shot where Helene had actually done temp ADR for the feature for Mantis. And James s- turned around and said, that's that's your wife, right? And I said, yes. And I said, by the way, James, at some point, I wanna ask you a question. He's like, oh, go ahead and ask me now. And I said, well, you know that my wife She's the 911 operator in, in the holiday special, and I wanted to see if maybe we could keep her in. He's like, she's in. So the great thing is, and she got paid for it. And not only that, 
she never went in and re-recorded it because it was recorded on my cell phone and everybody agreed that that the the quality was great and the performance was spot on so she did that in about three minutes and she got paid for a day and you know is credited in the holiday special so a pretty cool spouse adr story if i if i may say so myself well it's it's not always just spouses if you look really closely in the credits of guardians of the galaxy volume three the last name raskin shows up more than once fred what's going on there (laughs) When we were doing um, the uh, the voice recording for um, for Rocket, we we have uh, in the first flashback, it's Rocket as a baby, and James really wanted Rocket to sound childlike. Um, I mean, he has he has all of one word. He says the word hurts, and uh, James was like, "We need like a two year old," and I was like, "You know, James, I've got one of those." <laughs> So uh, th- this this led to about a week's worth of um, when whenever my daughter Noah um, was uh, w- was available, I would pull out my iPhone and get it about a foot away from her mouth, you know, and I would just say say hurts, and uh, and, and and finally uh, there was one day when I woke her up, or she, she she was waking up from a nap and she was particularly cranky, and I was like, oh, I got her, and I pulled out the phone and, <laughs> and I said say hurts, and she's like. <laughs> and yeah, it's in the movie. My 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 daughter Noah is uh is is baby rocket. She got a credit and everything. Um all the all the work that I've done on this movie, uh nothing makes me more proud than that. That is a great story. I love that. Um well, okay, so that in a sense that's kind of an easter egg. James seems like the kind of director that would like have his head in that space of like I got to you know, these are very important little easter eggs I want to fit in. Are there any that uh stand out to you and does he think along those lines? You know, the only thing that I'm really aware of is is the uh, like like the, the cameos. Lloyd Kaufman um, is is a is a James Gunn standard. <laughs> yes, <laughs> like, I, I wasn't going to uh, bring up Romeo and Juliet yet again in an interview with you, Fred. But um, <laughs> I'm glad you brought Lloyd up. Um, but it's always fun to spot Lloyd in the scene. <laughs> And actually, and and uh, you know, fans of the uh, of the first Guardians uh, will, will will note the reappearance of of the broker, at the poker table, also also uh, with 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 Lloyd in in, uh, in this movie. Um, I, I don't know that I could call that exactly an Easter egg, but it's it, it always brings a smile to my face to see those guys, and it's something that if you if you're not a super fan or if you're you're coming to this movie relatively fresh, you're not going to notice. But as a fan of James and his history, um, it's great to see those guys. You're burying the lead, Fred. This movie has the first Marvel DC crossover. I'm listening. Eagly. Oh. <laughs> Wait, Eagly's in this? You're right. <laughs> How can I forget? <laughs> How could you forget? I missed it. There's your Easter egg, man. <laughs> what's, what's great is I thought you were going to say this movie has the first F bomb in Marvel history, but no, no, you're. First- <laughs> <laughs> That, that's not an Easter egg. And by the way, that fucking pisses me off that they, they fucking showed the clip online before the movie came out. What are you doing? I'm guessing they had you do the temp scratch tracks for the F-bombs, Greg. <laughs> it is my favorite word. I think we talked about this last time. I think we did. Oh, I love that it, word. It, it is true that at, at the end of the movie, when, uh, when, when, when they are getting all of the animals um, off of the arete, um, eagerly... Eagly is one of the birds who can be spotted landing on Groot. <laughs> oh, can't believe I <laughs> you know, missed we had, that. We had, we had Weta doing doing the visual effects, um, and uh, it's like, why not? <laughs> why not? Matt, did you have to pay for for the screening that that, that you that you had of the movie? Um, I had to pay to park. That was pretty expensive. Does that count? No, I mean, I, I want the box office, dude. So <laughs> so go back and see it again, so you can see the Easter egg. Count on it. Thank you. Anything for you, Greg. I appreciate that. I know you do. You're a sweetheart. Eh, sometimes. <laughs> I do want to actually say along similar lines because I'm not. It's not. It's not that I'm trying to get you to see the movie that you've seen before again. But 
I, I do want to give credit to the, uh, the, the 3D team because uh, the, and this was something that was really fun. Like Greg uh, had never had never really been involved with this before. Um, and I was and, and for me, that's it's always something that, that I have fun with is, is checking out the, the 3D version. And I was like, you should you should come and check it out and, and see what they've done. It's always fun to see how much, especially with these movies, they like to push the in your face nature of the 3D. Um it, it, the guard the guardians movies like the the first two were designed with 3D in mind and this one wasn't but you would never know to watch what they'd done with it um they they, they they've done some really incredibly fun stuff where we there there's a there's a dynamic version of the movie that alternates between 240 widescreen and 189 uh IMAX and um in the two four zero sequences, like for example, the uh, the hallway fight where all of our heroes are battling the, uh, <laughs> the crustaceans and and the uh, the, the, the guards, um, it's in two four zero. But if a character is uh, is getting chopped in half, the blood will fly out and break the mat of the break the two four zero mat just to make it coming out at you as much as it possibly can. And and blurp jumps into the audience. Like I mean it's 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 a ton of fun. It, it is uh it is a totally legitimate way to experience the movie. And uh and, and this the stereo team just did did an amazing job with it. Let me jump in to to concur because Fred said, you know, you should come along to one of the sessions. And I had no interest, quite frankly. Um I checked out on 3D a while ago. And especially if something wasn't shot in 3D, I'm like, ah, just forget about it. And so we go one night and it immediately, uh, as Fred is saying, I, I see how fantastic uh, the work is that the stereo team is doing. And within five minutes, I'm like, I'm going to see this movie in 3D. So I am like a, a bunch of us are going uh, on Friday and then my wife and I go again on Saturday to see it in 3D IMAX. And again, this is from someone I'm telling you, I, I I came in a skeptic and came out thinking, I can't wait to see this in 3D because it, it actually is, it's a different experience. And even some things that, that you wouldn't think at first blush, there are certain shots where there's like this floor perspective where the camera's sort of on the floor that just in 3D, it, it 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 has a completely different vibe, and there, there's a specific shot, and I don't want to I, I don't want to ruin it for you. That uh, is just going to be so much fun to see it in 3D. Well, I'm glad you guys brought that up because that is a question that I had gotten into a rhythm of asking editors of bigger sci-fi VFX heavy movies was the validity of doing 3D these days. I mean, there was a time going back pre-pandemic where it was like, it's 3D, 3D, 3D. And then that seemed to, to sort of fade away. And now with trying to make sure more people go back to the theaters, it seems like it would be more important than ever to focus on an element like that. And yet it still doesn't feel like it's really taken hold. It sounds like you guys really enjoyed that aspect of it for this film. Do you think that is something that's that could be on the upswing again, something to draw the audiences back into theaters as, as an emphasis on 3D? I hope that's the case, but the one thing I wish they would do, if you wear glasses, it's still the fact that you then have to put glasses on top of glasses. It's a hat upon, on a hat. It, it just, quite frankly, it's a miserable experience. But when I was in the Bay one night, one of the, the stereo team, they were using clip-ons. And I said, hey, could I, could I try that? The clip-ons, it, it was a, a much better experience. But the, But the problem is, those only work for one of the 3D formats. So the the I, 3D IMAX that I'm going to go to, the clip-ons don't work for that. So I'm going to have to put the stupid glasses on. I would say, let's get people back in the theaters. Let's create experiences that you can only experience in the theater. And obviously one of those is 3D. But in that spirit, like let's let let's get clip-ons in all the formats and let's have them out there and available and i suspect a lot more people would 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 then go for it yeah i mean it is nice that for this movie there's like one showing per day that that's in 3d imax like uh <laughs> exactly there you go greg is holding up his 3d glasses for the home listening audience the clip the, the clip-ons <laughs> you can imagine this home listeners 
But I feel like the last few Marvel releases, the, the, the 3D version has not been readily available in this country. Um, it, it, from what I'm told, it's, it's still big overseas, but, uh, but has sort of lost its luster here, here in the States. Um, it seems like they're trying to, to a degree anyway, to bring it back. Um, and uh, what I've experienced, I mean, I, I've, I have seen a, a pass on the whole movie in 3D and it's, it's pretty great. Like it is a totally legit way to experience this movie. So I hope it comes back. It's not, not something that you would necessarily want for, uh, uh for, for, for a movie that's like entirely dialogue, but for this type of a movie, a big blockbuster entertainment, like it's, 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 it just adds to the experience. Yeah, but I heard I heard that they're 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 trying to uh, revive driving Miss Daisy in 3D. Can you imagine how awesome those driving shots will be? Hell yeah, Fred! Why don't you talk to Quentin about it? See if you can get him to do his last <laughs> movie in 3D. Um, maybe not. Uh, we started things off talking about just the sheer amount of work that goes into a project like this. I thought we should close it out reflecting on that work. What do you think about when you look back on your experience working on this franchise or on these films? It's a loaded question. I, I, I have uh, I have a ton of memories, you know, arriving in, in London, visiting the set on the first movie and, and seeing how all of this was coming together for the first time. I was on set for the first day of, of the second movie, and it was uh, the, it was shooting the, the first scene in the movie that has the Guardians together, what becomes the main title sequence. And, and watching those actors on day one be completely dialed into their characters. Like having Chris Pratt notice me and, oh, hey, Fred's here. Like, oh, the team was back together again. It was, uh, it's really something that feels special to have been a part of. And, you know, when dailies started coming in on this movie, it was the same thing. It's like, oh, the team is back together again. And the sequences where it's all of the team together and they're all interacting, like that's that's my favorite stuff. And the fact that James could write these characters so perfectly and have both the humor and the emotion, like all of it, uh, it's 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 really it's just been an amazing thing to get to see play out in front of me. And you know, I'm I'm really excited to see how audiences respond to it. Right now, like the the only audiences that have seen it have been like test screenings and and, and the press and the premiere. So it, it, it'll be exciting to see how the paying audience uh, responds to it. I have a specific memory, but I have to go back in time. When the first movie was released and I went with my family, my wife and my two kids, I remember the beginning of the movie with that heavy scene with Quill and his mom and thinking, this is not enjoyable. And then when it goes to Star-Lord on that planet and uh, the Redbone song kicks in and... I'm laughing. I'm like, okay, I'm a hundred percent in on this. This is fantastic. And my family loved the movie. So now let's flash forward. And the last friends and family screening that we had for volume three, I had asked James if my family could come and he said, yes. And they're huge fans of the franchise And quite frankly, they think it's pretty fucking cool that their dad is working with James Gunn. And so they come and they sit down and they sit to my left, to our left, one row in front of us and they're yakking. And then all of a sudden James comes in and sits right behind them. So uh, for again, imagine if you're, you know, a, a young kid and some director who you really admire is sitting one row behind you and you're about to see their movie. So they love the movie so much. So like they were pretty loud laughing and and all of that. And James had made note before he got introduced to them. He's like, who are these fucking people, you know, that are so loud. And he, you know, he gets introduced to my kids. He's like, Oh, it's you, it's you guys. So I actually had James sign uh, a poster for me. And he was gracious enough to sign it saying, hey, Dorier's, next time you see my film, can you kindly shut the fuck up? Love, James. <laughs> but here's the specific memory. Uh, my family, after that friends and family screening, we went out to have a steak dinner. And my youngest son says to me, says, God, Dad, who would have imagined years ago when we saw the first Guardians of the Galaxy that years later we'd be sitting in a friends and family screening one row in front of James Gunn? And that hit me and I'm like, he's absolutely right. Because I had no idea I would ever be a part of this. And I love the franchise as well. So 
that's my specific memory of thinking about that moment, laughing at Come and Get Your Love, and then being able to share that screening with my kids and my kids pointing that out. Like, I never would have imagined that I would have been a part of Guardians of the Galaxy. There's so much we could talk about with this film and the franchise and just you guys in general. And I always look forward to talking to you because I know... I know there's going to be a few barbs traded here and there, and it's going to be fun. So thank you for that. Thank you for not letting me down. Thank you for doing such a great job. And, uh, you know, Fred, you might sound like Drax, but to me, you'll always be Star-Lord in the country. <laughs> wow. Thank you, Matt. <laughs> I think after working on this franchise for over 10 years and three different films, Fred has earned that Star-Lord tag. The jury's still out on Dorier. What superhero would he be? Probably one whose special power is hurling F-bombs, but also editing great scenes. So much fun talking to those guys. I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope you learned a thing or two. They definitely dropped some science on that audio workflow stuff. Now, as far as that audio workflow stuff goes, Media Composer has great new features for interacting with Pro Tools, but don't listen to me about anything, really. No, go see for yourself and check out what's new in Avid Media Composer. That link in the show notes? Well, that's what it's there for. So click it, why don't you? Well, that'll do it for another episode of the show. We got to talk about another big movie, so it's probably time to dig back into some of the great work being done by TV editors. We'll see. Until the next one, this is Matt Fury thanking you for joining me right here on The Rough Cut. Rough Cut.